Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Karina Robinson, co-director of the Inclusion Initiative with my colleague, Associate Professor Grace Lorden. The new research centre at the LSE launched in November, and it brings together behavioural science and data to create inclusive corporate cultures. Over the next year, you can expect a steady stream of rigorous and relevant research from us. We're currently working on a number of fantastic projects. Um, they range from exploring how artificial intelligence can be used to promote inclusion in the workplace, to considering how luck versus effort is attributed across groups, to considering solutions to the obstacles facing Black professional women. Now, do follow us on Twitter at LSE underscore TII, or sign up to our newsletter. And on the chat function, um, you'll have directions on how, how to do that. And that chat box is also very important for your questions, because after 40 minutes, we will ask um, questions from the chat box, and they tend to be, let's be clear, some of the most interesting inputs that we get uh, in these events. Now, these events, it's the fifth of our Open Door, Open City monthly webinars. I think the name speaks for itself. We aim to open the door to the city, to business, to all talent, and to make sure they're included. And that is the best way to breed a culture of innovation, of openness, and of productivity. And that's exactly what the Entrepreneurs Network, our associate in this webinar, believes in. With 10,000 members, they cross the divide between policy and entrepreneurs. And a big welcome to all those who've joined us from the, the network. Now, we're fortunate to have with us Tommy Lube, CB, CBE. You will have seen his bio, so I'm just going to give you a little, a little snippet. Many years ago, he was visionary in understanding how tech could combine with financial services and security, something that seems terribly obvious now. On the back of it, he founded identity protection company Garlic, sold it. Then he set up Crossword Cybersecurity, which he now leads, along with his entrepreneurial hat, he also sits on the boards of the BBC and WPP and has a family. And I won't go on, Tom, I won't go on. Um, we're very, very glad to have you here and a big welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. I want to start with um, inclusion because a number of different issues, but inclusion is the one where we expect you to have a to have a lot of insight to give to us because it's been something you've been working on and maybe it wasn't called inclusion all your career. Now at the Inclusion Initiative we have a very specific uh, definition which is within the firm diverse voices should be heard in collaborative discussions and leaders must work to bring the missing voices into the firm to aid its purpose and profitability. Is this a view you share? Yes, yes, I think that that does capture the the essence of uh, of inclusion. Um, I think the things that I might add to it, if I was you know, expanding or having a conversation about it, is around how those voices are listened to, because I think that you can, and to me that partly points to the distinction between organisations that talk about inclusion, but their focus is really on diversity in the sense that they say, right, let's get more black Asian minority people, more women, more people with disabilities, uh, etc., into the organization, but let's not really listen to them. Let's just they get them in and count the numbers uh, and then we're sorted, sort of, sort of thing. Uh, and I think that's quite different to organizations that in their culture, they say we want to be inclusive and therefore they accept that being inclusive is going to result in their culture changing. And that's hard for organizations to do. So in my experience, they will tend to sort of shy away from that, focus more at the diversity end. They will say, look, we're kind of OK because we're getting lots of different people into the organization and we're even letting them in the room and giving them space to speak but we don't really listen and we don't really change as a result so I think culture first and diversity will 
will follow if you become an organization that's known as a genuinely inclusive you have a genuinely inclusive culture then you'll find that a whole range of people will come towards you uh, and that's i think where you're trying to get to as an organization well give me an you know real life example so obviously you created garlic and now you're creating um crosswood cyber security yeah what did you learn about creating a culture at Garlic that you're applying at Crosswood Cybersecurity? What did you do right and wrong? Yeah, I, I mean, I think my, my first big lesson in the strength of, of culture and how it can inform an organization and attract people was actually be, before Garlic, I was involved in uh, uh, cre creating Egg, the internet bank. I was one of the founding team there and Egg, had a very strong and very distinct culture that was deliberately created by the founding chief executive, Mike Harris, um, because he understood that you, you design and think about and create your culture in order to attract a certain type of person, uh, and then you get the diversity that you're looking for. When I created Garlic, we did push down that path, but not quite, I think, as explicitly as I am with Crossword. With Crossword, I and my executive team, and in fact, the broader team, have sat down and said, what sort of culture are we trying to create here? And we've got it down to four things. We've said the things that really matter to us are responsibility, openness, flexibility, and learning. And we want to push those things as far as we can. We want to be an organization that you know, are, is surprisingly open in the way that we talk to each other, is surprisingly flexible in the way that we accommodate different people's ways of working. It really emphasizes learning as being hugely important uh, as an organization to individuals and gives people responsibility. And we think that by doing that, we will attract people from all sorts of different backgrounds because they want to work differently, their, their way of working is different, and here is a culture that is all about flexibility. They want to learn quickly and rapidly, and you know, often people from diverse backgrounds, their careers will involve quite a lot of lateral movement. Um, you start here and then you move over there and then you move back over here. So you need to be in an organization that encourages learning and encourages that sort of lateral movement. So those are the things that we've been trying to do at Crossword. And responsibility, how does yes. that fit in? So we believe that the more that you push responsibility out to the team and they take ownership of it, the, the, the better the organization works. And therefore, the job of the leadership isn't to sort of micromanage people and lean over their shoulders and say, right, do this, then that, then that, then that. The job of the leadership is to create the context and say, this is what we're about and this is what we're trying to do. Now you, knowing that context, can grab it and run with it and take responsibility. And again, what you find with people from diverse backgrounds, you know, folk like myself as a black executive, I have had to work and hustle and shift from side to side and so forth. I've taken a lot of responsibility for my career to get to where I want to get to. What that means is that I will always perform better in a culture that emphasizes responsibility than I will in a culture that emphasizes control and uniformity and frankly, doing as you're told. Uh, and I think that's the same for a lot of people from diverse backgrounds because of the way they've had to be in order to work their way through society and through business cultures and so forth, they will have a strong bias towards responsibility. Okay, very interesting. I mean, and may I ask, and I, I, I totally get your point about diversity and people, you know, have numbers, but then what are your diversity numbers at Crossword Cybersecurity? I mean, they're, they're pretty good, really, in the sense that we are in the cybersecurity domain. And in that domain, it is uh, it's it's sort of a subset of 
um, of the IT domain. Now, the IT domain as a whole, I've been in the IT industry for 30 years now, and the IT industry is a remarkably, for, for such a new industry, it's a remarkably male and white industry. Uh, you know, you, you would sort of think it would be much more diverse given that it's sort of IT and it's new and young people and so forth. But somehow uh, we in the IT industry seem to have created an entire, uh, entire industry that is surprisingly un, undiverse. And then within that, the cybersecurity segment of that is even more like that because it's quite a sort of technical specialism and so forth. Um, and we have worked quite hard as a company to make sure that we uh, are, we're not, we haven't got gender parity, but we do have uh, a lot of excellent women uh, as software engineers in our organization and as consultants. Um, we are quite diverse ethnically as well, more than the average company. So we've worked quite hard to, to make sure that we're kind of as much as we can are, are living our values. Okay. Um, now, again, this very good point you made about diversity versus inclusion and how you need you need, really need both. So there have been a plethora of reviews, the Parker review, the this review, the that review, um, but a new initiatives that seem very hopeful on the back of Black mm. Lives Matter. Yeah. Change the race ratio, others, and where companies, I think change the race ratio, which is about getting more um, top black executives in there at various levels, 75 companies, household names have signed up to those. And there are some very clear outlines of the goals they need to reach over the next few years. Does this fill you with hope or are you concerned that they're going to, I mean, it can't be a box ticking exercise because it's serious numbers. Mm -hmm. I think it's positive. I think that, but I think that what we have to, understand is that this this journey this inclusion and, and diversity journey that we're on I relate to it as something of a relay race uh, it's um, yeah, we we run our bit we push as far as we can in our careers then we're going to hand over the baton to the next group they're going to take it forward further they're going to hand it over again uh, and I think where it can be frustrating is when people think right, you know, we're the ones that are going to burst through the finish line and then it's done. We've sorted diversity and inclusion. Uh, and I think to myself, no, 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 you don't understand. We're, you're in a relay race here uh, and you're running leg number two and, we, you know, and the generation after you is going to run leg number three and the generation after that is going to run leg number four. And maybe that fourth leg is going to get to where we need to be. But don't kid yourself that you are that fourth leg. You're the second leg here. So so, so that's what you're running now. So, at, so what you need to do is push as hard as you can and pass the baton on in a way that takes things, uh, that, that gives the next generation the chance to push harder again and be satisfied that you've run that leg well enough. Uh, and I think organisations now, motivated and, and inspired by what happened last year, are picking their heads up and are starting to move, but organizations, they move slowly and it, yeah, it will take several years. So I think we're gonna need to judge the progress that's being made over the next two or three years, rather than saying, right, Black Lives Matter, all of that happened last year, a year on where are we and what, what have we achieved? Um, I think if we look at it like that, we're probably gonna get quite disappointed. I think we're going to have to look at a year on, have the programs that were set up, are they in action? The announcements that people made, have they turned into money and action? And have we started to embed this, this leg of the journey, uh, if you like? I think that's very interesting what you say about the relay race, because with gender, Mm. where we started it earlier, uh, that's exactly what we found. You have to actually keep on pushing and figure out what the next stage is and the next stage. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, absolutely. you know, I do wonder about, we know diversity and inclusion is good for business. We've had all these sort of McKinsey, Harvard Business Review, mm. proving it is. And yet, and yet, business 
talks about it, but hasn't really done it. Yeah. What, what more do we need to do? I think that on the whole, businesses at the moment don't really believe it. So I, I don't think that they, on the whole, really accept that the McKinsey figures and the other figures are proof. I think what they relate to them as, as sort of interesting, interesting evidence that you can use if you're trying to build a business case in the boardroom. But that's kind of different from, I believe it in my bones, because you're dealing with quite um, rational, yeah, it's somewhat hard-nosed sometimes business people. And if they really thought that doing this was going to add you know, 10% to their bottom line or something, they, they would just do it. Um, so, you know, and, and occasionally things come up. But, it, but the thing with businesses you find is it's the same in other areas. So, you know, 20 years ago, whenever it was, the internet started coming through, people started creating websites. There was the you know, beginnings of, you know, there were people saying this is gonna change everything. And, you know, businesses, the larger businesses and then medium-sized businesses were sort of saying, yes, yes, I, I, hear, I hear all that. And I see this McKinsey report saying it's gonna change everything. And I'll probably set up a website, but I'm not sure I really believe it. And then five or 10 years later, they think, gosh, it, this, is, this is actually true. And then they start to change. I think in a sense, we're at that stage now where businesses are sort of saying, yes, yes, I hear this diversity stuff and I read the McKinsey report. Um, I don't want to get beaten up, so I'll probably do some stuff to make sure I don't get in trouble. But do I believe in my bones that if I make my organization more diverse and inclusive, it will really perform better from a business point of view? Do I really believe that? I'm not sure I really believe it at the moment. I think that as businesses start to push on diversity and inclusion, and some of them are more successful at changing their cultures and becoming more diverse, and then actually start to perform better, you'll find that the other ones say, oh, okay, they weren't making that stuff up. It's, it's actually true. And then you'll see change as a result of it. Okay. Getting back to that point you made about responsibility being, you know, one of the four attributes of, of crossword, creating an inclusive culture. It implies to me that you have also, you have room to fail. So yes. you are actually giving your employees room to fail. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So, I, you know, I often say um, if, if I go to an interview or, or you know, somebody says, hey, Tom, what's what's your what's your best skill? Uh, I say failure. I am good at failure. <laughs> I'm good at anyone else. I fail so, so often and so much. And then I just learn and come back again. You know, I, um, I just keep going when, when other people give up. I, I remember when I was first applying for, for jobs, I, I, I wanted to get into the IT industry and sort of 20, 30 years ago, um, there was a, a, a encyclopedia almost a, a directory called the computer users yearbook and it listed every major company i mean you couldn't have it now but it listed every major company that had a significant computer department and i thought oh this is easy i'll just apply to all of them and <laughs> and so i st i started at the letter a and i just started applying i applied to every company in england as far as i could tell that began with a that had a computer department and all of them said no and then i started on the b's and i got to british airways and they gave me, they gave me a job and to me that was a massive success because i only had to get to the b's uh, i didn't even need to get to x or y or z to other people they would have given up after the first 50 or so when i did my mba um, i was uh, yeah, so I remember a chap coming up to me saying, oh, Tom, it's so difficult. I've applied for 10 jobs and I haven't even got a reply. And I was thinking, and I said, oh, dear, oh, that's hard. But inside I was thinking 10 jobs, 50 jobs. I'm just loosening up. You know? <laughs> so, so failure is is part. It's it's not it's not a problem. It's not it's it's the way you succeed. Um, and. 
on the whole, businesses are averse to failure. So, and therefore, why take a risk? Nobody went, you know, the old phrase of nobody got fired for buying IBM that, that used to be a phrase uh, back in the day. It, you know, you, if, you, if you employ someone who looks like the rest of the organization, has a similar background to the senior people in your organization, you know, is kind of not outstanding, but not kind of a left field candidate, you're not going to get in trouble for that. So that's the default. If you employ someone who's very different, different personality, looks different, their career path has been really sort of left field, and you make the decision to employ that person, gosh, what if they turn out to be useless? That looks really bad uh, on you. And so an organization that doesn't embrace failure, almost by definition, is not going to be able to embrace diversity and inclusion in a way that an organization that understands that failure is the part of the way that you succeed. I mean, I think also, you know, when you talk about failure, it's also about persistence. Tom. Yes. Can I say yes. that's another lesson? But actually, since you talk about sort of nobody got fired for hiring IBM, they also talk about nobody gets fired for hiring Goldman Sachs. And you were at Goldman Sachs very early on in your career. Um, and Goldman Sachs has certainly had a few problems of its own, reputational and otherwise. Yeah. Why, what made you leave Goldman Sachs? Yeah, I mean, it was fascinating. I, I really wanted to work there. I had 16 interviews uh, to, to get in uh, over a sort of three, four month period. That's the, the, the way they used to interview then. I don't know if they do it now, but then you would just interview after interview after interview. And at any point in the process, anyone you met could just say no this isn't a goldman's guy and then you then that was the end of of your process and so you had to convince this whole wave of people and then you got hired um when i got into the organization and bear in mind this is the mid 90s i think so quite some time ago um it it turned out it, to be on the one hand to be an incredible organization a force of nature that could get things done on the other hand it just didn't feel like the right organization for me. And it had some issues around that time, around diversity, actually. And, and I got caught up in, uh, in one of them. Uh, and I just felt this isn't, this is a brilliant, it was a funny sort of feeling. This is a, an amazing organization. It's just not the organization that I can flourish in. Um, so I need to accept that and I need to do what's in my heart now and go and be an entrepreneur. I, there was no company that I wanted to aspire to after having worked at Goldman's, um, but I thought, you know, I, I thought I can't complain about this. I can't say, well, this organization doesn't have the culture I want, but I'm gonna spend the next 20 years in it anyway. If I want the culture I want, it's time I jolly well created my own company and built it with the culture that I want. And that was a big move at the time. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, and it was funny, you know, as you say, it's, it's one of those organizations where, because again, there were so few black people at Goldman's at the time. And in fact, so few black people in, in general in, in investment banking, that friends of mine used to introduce me to other people as, this is Tom, he works at Goldman, as if that was part of my, <laughs> <laughs> part of my name and then when I left they were mortified I was I was happy but they they would say this is Tom he used to work at Goldman <laughs> so that was a, a funny period would you, would you say now and we're living in a very different world would you yeah. say now to a young black professional who's in their first years of a career in the city and doesn't have a deep desire to be an entrepreneur entrepreneur would you say to them it doesn't matter if they don't have a culture of diversity and inclusion stay there and work to make that happen or would you say get out and go somewhere else where you'll be appreciated what advice would you give yeah yeah i i think that now you as as a young black executive um you, you can choose to stay in an organization. Now, it won't be as lone, generally, it won't be as lonely as it was back in, uh, in, in the days when I was working in the city, at, you know, when I was at the London Stock Exchange before Goldman's, 
I think I was in a department of 2000 people and was the only black person, or maybe there were two of us or, or something. So, um, but, but you would, that would be pretty rare now. Um, so there will be other executives senior to you. There, there, you know, there won't be many at the top tier, but there will be some, there'll be some mid career, there'll be quite a group earlier on. And, and therefore, even if the organization doesn't have the inclusive, diverse culture that you would wish it had right now, there, there will be levers that you can pull in order to move it forward. So I would say today, if you're set on a corporate career and you're in an organization that you want to develop that career in, even if it's, uh, its culture isn't the way you want it today, stick with it because all of them are moving now. It's like glaciers. All of them are starting to move. And uh, that's uh, not the not, that's not the best metaphor. <laughs> that's true. Sorry. <laughs> um, let's talk a bit about entrepreneurship. Yeah. The government has leaked. I mean, there are two things that are happening that are relevant. The government has leaked that it's considering raising capital gains tax to the level of income tax, but we're talking top income tax here. Plus, there's another possible thing, which is board directors will be, quote, fined and banned for inaccuracies in their company's accounts. And now, most non-execs don't have the level of knowledge um, about the company's accounts. You know, and if your auditors haven't found anything, how are you meant to? But anyway, surely these are two big disincentives for entrepreneurs. I think it depends on the type of entrepreneur. Um, so um, the sort of entrepreneur that I am and some of the entrepreneurs I know, we, we were gonna be entrepreneurs, whatever's thrown at, at us. You, know, you, can't, you can't sort of stop yourself really. I don't think I've, you know, I personally, I'm sure there are others, but I personally don't think I've met an entrepreneur or I don't think I've met yeah, a serious entrepreneur who said to me, you know, Tom, I was thinking of starting up this business with this business idea, but then I looked at the tax regulation and I thought, no, I'll stay in corporate life. That's just, <laughs> it's just not what entrepreneurs do. They, they might complain about it when they're in it and they'll fight it and they'll write uh, articles about it and go to the newspapers and all the rest of it. But real entrepreneurs are going to battle to be entrepreneurs wherever they are. And, you know, Britain, we kind of move the dial a little bit this way, a little bit that way. But in the scheme of things, this is a, an awesome place to, to set up businesses. There, there's capital, there's opportunity, there's a market, et cetera, et cetera. So the government will sort of move the dial this way and that, and then another government will move the dial this way and that. But for entrepreneurs, it's it's fine. You know, I would I would be starting up a business. You, know, you you could you could shift the tax rate this way, that way. You could do all sorts of things with rules. I'm still going to start a business. Okay. It, it will about, put some people off. Though. Okay, but what about you know? One of the things is an amazing group of talent. I mean, talent mm. all over the UK, but a lot of that talent is imported, mm. and the new immigration regime is. Other than in sort of fintech, it's, I mean, obsessed, it's obsessed with fintech when entrepreneurs are in all industries, but it's really complicated, it's really expensive, and as a result, you know, a number of people are being put off coming to this country. Do, I mean, do you think this is an issue? Should we be working on the government, lobbying them to change this new immigration policy? I think it is... A, a, an environment that, you know, the, the examples that I talked about as an inclusive culture, I think they apply to a, a business culture more broadly, as well as an individual company. The more inclusive the business culture, the more diverse the business culture, the, the healthier it's going to be in terms of the creation of companies and, uh, and so forth. So anything that tends to encourage diversity and inclusion across the business culture uh, and openness 
is probably going to be a good thing from an entrepreneurial point of view. Uh, and anything that discourages that is probably not particularly a good thing from, from an entrepreneurial point of view. So um, now entrepreneur, and, and if you want sort of fearless, ambitious, hungry people who are willing to take risks and so forth, um, then often they'll, they'll come from certain backgrounds and experiences. Um, on the other hand, you need to sort of work and figure out how you generate that type of fearlessness and ambition in people up and down the UK uh, as well, you know, and how do, how do you reach into the, uh, the, you know, the estates up in the north and say, there's, there must be entrepreneurial talent in there. How are we going to unleash that and, and get that out uh, uh, as well? Okay, so a sort of balanced view. <laughs> or I would say a non-committal. Is this because you're on the BBC board and you have to be very non-political? Am I allowed to ask you, um, actually, I will ask you, uh, on the board of the BBC, what steps did the BBC take on the back of Black Lives Matter? Yeah, we we took actually we we did some really interesting things that I, I was very proud of. Um, so uh, one of the one of the people that came into the organisation was a lady called June Sarpong who came in as creative diversity uh, director. Now actually she came in before the Black Lives Matter uh, episodes and and had started to, uh, to to get properly engaged. There were a couple of interesting things there. One was that she came in as creative diversity director onto the EXCO, onto the executive committee, reporting to the director general, the BBC's equivalent of the chief executive. Um, she wasn't reporting through the HR line, that, that wasn't where, where she, she sat. She, she had a, a direct responsibility for driving forward creative diversity, sitting on the executive committee, reporting to the equivalent of the chief executive. That was really important. And I think really important in then driving some of the BBC's response uh, as we responded to uh, Black Lives Matter. So one of the things that we did that she was very instrumental in, I played my role in as well, was getting a commitment that the BBC would spend a hundred million pounds of its uh, content budget over the next three years on diverse and inclusive content. Uh, and that was you know, real and is real, tangible, meaningful amounts of money that will go towards uh, um, content that is, that is uh, telling diverse stories, is developed by diverse teams, is commissioning diverse led uh, production companies, you know, that, and, that, and that's significant amounts uh, of money. No, no one in the industry has committed that sort of level of commitment uh, in, in this area. We also said that we wanted to push into the supply chain as well. So the production companies that work with us, we want to see diversity in them as well. And, and therefore we will be looking for commitments from the supply chain. And I think large organizations can use their power to push diversity out beyond their own boundaries into their supply chains as well. Uh, and the other thing that we did is we said that in most organizations, there's the board, there's the executive committee, and then below the executive committee, there'll often be maybe 10 or 12 or 15 committees or boards where actually a lot of the power sits, a lot of the decisions are made, budgets are held uh, and so forth. And often at the leadership level, there's a push to say, we need more black or Asian people or other diverse people on the board or on the executive committee. A lot of the power sits just below that. And what we said is we must have at least two diverse people on every single board below the executive committee and not something that we would work gradually towards over the next two or three years but would get done immediately uh, and so the chairs of each of those committees within the next few months had to go out and get people onto the onto their 
uh, boards from within the organization so that there is no decision making room in the organization that won't have diverse voices in it. So those sort of tangible things, I mean, there's a lot to do. We've done a lot, but there's a lot more to do and cultures evolve and change slowly. But those are some of the tangible things uh, that we did quite quickly. It's, it's absolutely true what you say about, about using the power of, well, it's using the power of money because, um, you know, we recently had a, a future Lord Mayor Mm -hmm. um, who's done a huge amount of work for the LBGTQ plus uh, group. And one of the things he did when he was at GP Morgan is he used their budget so that their suppliers had to have inclusive cultures. And if they didn't, they yeah. wouldn't be on the list of suppliers. So you're also on the board of WPP, the largest advertising agency in the world. Are you trying to apply some of those lessons or are they, do they already have their own learnings? So WPP actually, before I arrived, had already committed $30 million uh, as a diverse fund that it would use both internally and externally to, to drive forward uh, diversity in the wake of, uh, of Black Lives Matter. So I was really excited and that was actually one of the things that attracted me to join the organization was that you know, it, it hadn't just uh, you know, put up a, a banner saying Black Lives Matter and so forth. It had actually put some real commitment behind it uh, as well. Um, and I'm still early days in the organization. I'm maybe five or six months into the organization. It's a huge uh, complex organization so I'm getting to know it and I, so I don't want to be too uh, presumptuous about what, what I can bring but certainly I can bring a diverse voice into the boardroom of what is one of the world's largest uh, organizations and you know I'm not in my career as I said perhaps as I've got older um, and and there's a lot of power in this issue of diversity as well but I'm at the stage where I'm happy to express a voice as a senior black executive. Um, earlier in people's careers, you, you hear people saying, well, I just want to be an executive and I don't want to be known as black or don't, you know, don't think of me as a, a woman executive, I'm just an executive, etc." cetera. Um, and then you get to a stage in your career where you are, you know that you're an excellent executive. So you don't, so you just know that and you're more comfortable just expressing yourself and telling your story. And I'm at that stage now. So, so I will be doing that in any organization I'm involved with. That's a wonderful thing about age, more wrinkles, okay? But my God, a bit of wisdom and, <laughs> and the confidence to be fully yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, what about, the longer term business effects of COVID-19, because one of our researchers, Teresa Almeida, has been doing some interesting work on it. And, you know, in terms of diversity and inclusion, it's, it's pretty bad results that we're seeing all around us. What, what do you think changes are here to stay and what can be done to make things better? Yes, I think it's, it's really interesting. I mean, I, I think what we might see so some of the things that we've seen from organizations, you know, speed, the speed at which they've changed, um, they, they, they've had to speed, speed up. So if you think about many of these organizations, if you had said to them a year ago or yeah, a, a year or more ago, right, we want you to go to fully remote working and fully flexible working, then that would have started with a year to 18 long, 18 month long study that would have then led to some recommendations and et cetera, et cetera. And maybe in four or five years time, after a few pilots, then 20% of their staff would have started working remotely. Yes. <laughs> Instead of that, 100% of their staff started working remotely immediately. What that does is it sort of says to all organizations, if you want to change, you can. So there is no longer an excuse that says, well, 
we would love to do this, this thing that you're telling us to do to promote diversity or inclusion. We would love to do it. We just can't. It's too difficult. It's going to take too long uh, because there are just too many examples now to point to over the last year where organizations of all sorts of sizes have changed fundamentally. Uh, and therefore, I think that that creates an opportunity. It creates an opportunity to have conversations with organizations to ask for change that they can't possibly say, we, we would love to do it, we can't. It just, it strips that away and it becomes a conversation about, is that something you really want to do? Because we now know that if you really want to do something, you can just do it. So that speed, the flexibility, uh, I think will be things that come out of this as changes that businesses can't now put back in the box. I think there is, to some extent, a respect for expertise that perhaps was softening. But what we've seen over the last year is that we've had to go to the experts in all areas, not just on the medical side. If you're going to go remote, you have to go to the technical experts, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So expertise has become almost more valued. And often what you'll find with people from diverse backgrounds is their way into organizations can often be by building real expertise in a particular area. Uh, and therefore, if the environment has shifted to valuing expertise more, I think that can play in a positive uh, way. Um, I think there is perhaps more of a focus and value on supply chains and on organizations being more networked as well. You know, people realized that if you're a business in the UK and your suppliers are in China or Europe or wherever it is, and you didn't really worry about that, now you need to worry about that and you need to understand your supply chains in a way that perhaps you didn't need to uh, in the past. And I think, again, that creates opportunities. I think, in a sense, organizations will want to diversify their supply chains. They won't want to be as reliant on that single supplier as they used to be. If they're diversifying their supply chains and you are a supplier and maybe you're a supplier, a, a diverse person leading a business, again, it creates opportunity. So whilst there are some very clear negative long-term effects, I think some of those sorts of effects in a funny way create opportunities to push forward the inclusivity conversation. Thank you, Tom. That is yeah, wonderful to hear those because they are, as you say, I mean, there are always two sides to a story and every crisis brings lots of opportunities. Now, what I'd like to do is turn to our global audience for questions, but we have to start with our very own Erica Brognon. Mm -hmm. Erica, would you come on? Um, and the reason I can call her our very own is that although she's a black entrepreneur who's working on her second startup and been out there for a long time, she's actually doing her second startup along with a PhD at the Inclusion Initiative. Wow. Erica, um, a big welcome. And do please um, ask Tom a few questions. Thank you um, for the opportunity, Karina. And Tom, thank you for, for being here. I've, um, as always, I sit and listen to you um, uh, in awe. Um, and so I guess I have a couple of questions. Um, my research at, uh, in the Inclusion Initiative really centers around inclusion in innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, literature is pointing to the fact that despite increased numbers of graduates from um, diverse genders and ethnicities, technology companies and innovation in um, particularly in areas like artificial intelligence are largely being um, created by an incredibly homogenous group of innovators. You mentioned this earlier um, and therefore they're subject to continued bias. Um, a report I authored um, just last year found that only 38 black entrepreneurs had received less than a quarter of a percent of the venture capital that had been deployed in the last 10 years, for example. 
So speaking as an entrepreneur, do you have any thoughts on on a few tangible actions that could be taken to increase um, inclusion of diverse entrepreneurs, particularly those um, who are ethnically diverse? Um, You you mentioned quotas um, that the the BBC are implementing. Are they the answers, Um, you know, or, or what else do you think might work? Yeah, yeah. Actually, just to be clear, I don't think I'm, well, I talked about um, you know, what the BBC is doing in terms of you know, funding and so forth, but uh, uh, we, we don't talk specifically about quotas uh, as such. Um, in, um, as entrepreneurs, uh, I, I think that yeah, being an entrepreneur is, is, is tough. It is, it is tough. And you know, because you, you've done it several times now, and I've done it multiple times. Um, I think that in the AI space, it is really, really important that we see a lot of diversity going into, into that space. Because I think that what's happening there is that um, essentially culture is being codified um, into algorithms that will then decide decisions that are being made that affect all of all of society. And if those algorithms and the data that drives the algorithms and shapes their their decisions uh, don't come from a culture of inclusivity and diversity, then I don't know why anyone would expect the output. Uh, to result in inclusive and diverse decisions, you sort of get get out what you what you put in to uh, to some extent. So I think it's really important that people from all sorts of backgrounds uh, and uh, you know, particularly you know black Asian minority executives um, get into those areas. Uh, and uh, and sometimes what you see is that um, there's. Some, I sometimes say to people, you know, you might be drawn to, I want to get into law, or I want to get into banking and so forth. Yeah, that's kind of okay. But really, I want you to get into AI and I want you to get into being an entrepreneur. That is just so, so, so important to us. I think the venture capital community have to kind of really hold up a mirror to themselves uh, and say, what are we doing? I think on the whole, they are they tend to be quite, um, I was going to say, they, they, they can be quite pleased with themselves uh, because, and it's easy to be pleased with yourself when you've got lots of money and entrepreneurs come begging you for money. It can kind of create, but sometimes they kind of need to look at themselves a bit and say, you know, we, we ourselves are not very diverse. There, there are a few initiatives. So uh, there's a, a company called, a VC firm called Impact X. Uh, that a chap called Eric Collins has set up, and there are various others that are particularly uh, focused on minority entrepreneurs. So hopefully we'll see more of those. And what you might see is the limited partners that fund venture capital firms putting some of their money into those sorts of firms. You know, if you had something like an Impact X with a hundred million pounds to invest in businesses, that would be a really big deal. Uh, And therefore, what you want to see is some of these huge organizations that are thinking about what they can do on the diversity side, they could be getting behind either focused VC firms that are supporting diverse entrepreneurs or getting behind mainstream VC firms, but saying to them, we will support you with money and assets, but only if you use that money in this way. And those would be some tangible things that I think would make a difference. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I guess my next question uh, looks at um, a different kind of diversity. So we've spoken a bit about being ethnically diverse and gender diversity, but not that much about socioeconomic class and Mm. networks. Mm. Um, So many diverse candidates, particularly those from ethnically diverse backgrounds, don't have the opportunity to obtain an elite education or um, gain access to um, elite networks. Mm. So given the importance of signalling, Tom, Tom, who used to work at at Goldman, um, (laughs) (laughs) um, uh, uh, in, in being able to advance in careers, how would you advise that those from lower socioeconomic tiers um, make themselves 
themselves attractive to corporates like Goldman if they haven't received an elite education. Um, and, and, and then that's, that's looking at it from one side, but that presupposes that um, the diverse candidates need to solve the problem that the organizations actually have. So then what could organizations also do to ensure that they're not overlooking exceptional talent? Yeah, yeah, no, really good questions. And, and uh, by the way, I didn't have a, <laughs> an elite education, that's for sure. <laughs> Uh, but, and you've uh, managed to crack it, which is exactly <laughs> why I think you are best placed to tell others ex how, how to do the same. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the networks is is absolutely absolutely key. You know, as an entrepreneur, um, I, I live off my networks. That's that's how I'm successful. I, I know people. I I uh, I network like crazy and and so forth. Even though actually. I'm quite an introvert person. So you have to find the style of networking that works for you uh, as, as an individual. I think organizations, organizations now are getting much better at um, you know, being more open to people from a range of, of backgrounds. There's a chap I know, Derek Brown, who's doing some brilliant work with organizations like Salesforce and others in running programs that are specifically looking for diverse people, but not looking at their university or even at their education at all. They, it, just looking at their aptitude, uh, aptitude and attitude, and bringing them into a program that then develops them and then shows them to the organization. And, and then the organization picks the folk that it wants and develops them further. Uh, and I think organizations engaging in those sorts of programs um, is, is the way to open up. As you said, I think it's not so much about the individual saying, right, wh what do I need to do in order to get into that elite organization over there? The emphasis has to be on that organization opening up its doors in, in different ways to different people, not in a tokenistic way, but in a way that says, we are really convinced that some of our most brilliant people are going to come from very different backgrounds to some of the folk at the top. I mean, I do that in a sense in my, I have a school in Ghana, the Africa Science Academy, and we look for young women across the continent who come from very underprivileged or relatively underprivileged backgrounds, but are exceptionally academically gifted. Um, and so we're looking for a different type of person that we can bring into a program and then send them off into the world. And I think organizations need to do that sort of thing in order to really open their doors. Absolutely. And, and this you, you've just touched briefly on my final question, um, which is, you know, what is the role of education in ensuring that we prepare diverse candidates effectively for the future of work? Um, and then what are you doing in your schools to champion diversity at the earliest opportunity, both ASA and Ghana, but but also the Hammersmith School here and um, uh, and, and that sort, that sort yeah, of thing? Yeah. Um, I mean, education is, is absolutely Absolutely key. It's it's interesting what you know what subjects one should focus on. I remember doing a talk once where you know, uh, one of the students said, you know, if I want to be an entrepreneur, what what uh, what subject would you suggest I focus on? Uh, and I could see at the side of the room the business studies master was sort of standing there and smiling, saying, yeah, this is this, is. and you know the maths teacher was saying they got to know their numbers, uh, and I said. Uh, slightly controversially, but I said drama. <laughs> and the drama teacher sort of went, yeah, <laughs> at last somebody recognizes. Because you're, as an entrepreneur, your ability to communicate, you're constantly communicating, you're, you're selling, you're convincing, you're cajoling, etc. That you've got to find that. You've got to find your way, not someone else's way, but your way uh, of doing that. Um, and I, I think in, in general, education. Um, there's a chap called Rod Aldridge who set up a number of academies, the Darwin Aldridge Academy, the Brighton Aldridge Academy and so forth, and they have 
entrepreneurship at their heart, because what they say is that the skills that they can teach you um, to be an entrepreneur, the, the resilience that was mentioned earlier, the dealing with failure, the innovation, these are skills that actually apply in any sort of business. So I think if schools kind of understand the, the joy of being an entrepreneur and share that with their students, and uh, then not all of their students, in fact, only a fraction of their students will actually go off to be entrepreneurs, but that set of skills, life skills that they earn, will earn them in good stead, whether they go into government, into the not-for-profit sector, in, into corporate life. So I, I think education is absolutely key to that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Erica. Brilliant. Um, I think we have only have time probably for one question, but this is a very good one because actually it picks up a point that Erica, well, that actually that um, you, Tom, made, tokenism. So the question is, a big challenge when picking diverse people for boards is the threat of tokenism. Mm -hmm. Do you see a push for board candidates that have a diverse background and experience? Can I just add one little thing there, which is as somebody who is diverse, choose me for a board. I don't care if you choose me because I'm a token, because once I'm there, I won't be. Now, Tom, what's your answer to that? <laughs> I'm, I'm exactly the same, actually. I, you know, if somebody says to me, uh, you know, Tom, we want to put you on this board and we're only doing it because before they've even finished the sentence, I'm sitting at the board because <laughs> I don't care. I will take the seat anyway. In fact, you know, in, in a funny way, if you... When I, if I go into a, a boardroom and there's a, a bunch of folks sitting around the table and, you know, several of them have come from very, very sort of traditional backgrounds and the, the golf course and the independent school and the, the Russell Group University, um, you know, I, I think to myself, I wonder if they know that they've partly been chosen because that's their background. <laughs> so I just don't worry about it at all. I will take the seat uh, and I will do what, you know, I would hope that within the first meeting, people will realise that not only have they got a diverse person, but they've got someone that's really worth having. So I think as individuals, we should worry about ourselves. We should get ourselves ready to take those positions and just get in the room and make your contribution. That's that's what matters. Yeah. And you're making your contribution not just for yourself, Absolutely. but for everybody else who's diverse out there. Absolutely. 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 Um, Tom, we could go on. There's so many other things, um, but we can't actually. We have no more time, but a huge thank you uh, to Tom for fitting us into his mega busy diary. And did you do drama at school, by the way? <laughs> I was in a school play once. <laughs> ah, well, okay, once, but yeah, yeah. Anyway, a very instructive and illuminating talk. Um, and thank you also to the Entrepreneurs Network, because I think you will have learnt uh, quite a bit as well from everything Tom has been saying. Do tune in for our next Open Door, Open City webinar next month with Poppy Jarman, who's the charismatic CEO of the City Mental Health Alliance. Uh, also, actually, very much an entrepreneur because uh, it was something she set up pretty much from scratch. From all of us here at the Inclusion Initiative, thank you again to Tom for an outstanding performance, dare I say. Thank you and goodbye. And thank you, Eric, as well. Great questions. <laughs>